Intel's Hades Canyon Nook is well named. It's either a reference to hell freezing over, as AMD and Intel work together on a product, or a reference to the combined heat of Vega and an i7 in a box that's 8.5 by 5.5 inches in size. Our review of Hades Canyon looks at overclocking potential, preempting something bigger for us, and benchmarks the combined i7 CPU and Vega M GPU for gaming and production performance. We're also looking at thermal performance and noise as usual, and as a unit, it's one of the smallest, most powerful systems on the consumer market right now. We'll see if it's worth it. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. There are two primary SKUs for the Intel Nook on Newegg, and that's separate from Intel's direct sales. The ones on Newegg are bare bones. Our unit would be the equivalent of a $1,000 unit on Newegg, and that includes an i7-8809G, one of the new G-series processors that's actually giving NVIDIA a lot of trouble right now and will continue to do so. That's got eight megabytes of cache, with a limited core turbo of 4.2 gigahertz. The CPU is unlocked for overclocking, which we'll be doing momentarily. And importantly, it's coupled with an AMD product, the Vega M GPU, specifically Vega M GH, whereas the cheaper unit has a Vega M GL GPU. So this is also overclockable, and uh, they are not on the same die package, but they're adjacent to each other in the unit, which this is the whole thing right here. So you've got your GPU and CPU both on this side of the board covered by a single cold plate for heat sinking. If you buy straight from Intel's Simply Nook website, the Nook 8i7HVK that we reviewed here comes fully configured for $1,200, including eight gigabytes of DDR4 and a 128 gigabyte SSD with Windows 10. Not unreasonable, really, in terms of price. The cheaper unit runs about $200 lower and instead it ships with an 8705G at 4.1 gigahertz and Vega M GL graphics. The differences are these. The higher end unit runs 100 megahertz faster on a quad core eight thread CPU and has a TDP of 100 watts instead of 65. And the Vega GPU also runs 24 compute units instead of 20 compute units, resulting in 1536 streaming processors versus 1280. Frequencies also change the GPU in Vega MGH runs at 1190 MHz, which we successfully overclocked later to 1320 MHz before hitting thermal limits. The Vega MGL GPU runs at 1011 MHz, and the memory interface is just 1024 bits wide, which is narrow for HBM and results in a bandwidth of 179 GB per second for Vega MGL and 205 for Vega MGH. Those are the differences. We weren't sure what to expect for performance starting out, so we ran the Nook through our low-end component benchmarks for APUs and cheap DGPUs, and we later moved on to high-end testing for reasons quickly explained. In Rocket League, for example, we rapidly became bound in the low-end GPU testing for earlier GT1030 and APU benchmarking, as illustrated by the rough 62 FPS limiter, the stock Hades Canyon system operated at 162 FPS average, several times higher in frame rate than the R3-1200 and GT-1030. We clearly need to move to higher end comparisons. Overclocking the Nook, despite ear bleeding fan noise when overclocked, netted us an impressive 12% performance uplift here. That's from 4.3 gigahertz all core and 1320 megahertz on the GPU with 900 megahertz on the HBM. Dota 2 further drove this point home, again landing multiple times faster in average FPS than the next fastest low-end components. 0.1% lows weren't great, but that's a limitation of Dota 2, not the Intel unit. CSGO finally put the nail in the coffin. We were running nearly 300 FPS average at times, well ahead of the 4560 and GT 1030 combination. So let's move on to the higher-end benchmarks. Basically, the low-end stuff sort of illustrates where we expected the thing to perform. This and its predecessors are inherently small living room targeted PCs. The difference is the predecessors working off of basically entirely Intel parts and Intel graphics have been pretty limited in performance. The addition of Vega here was a brilliant one 
and it's good that AMD and Intel could work together on it because the product that came out is something significantly more powerful than what Intel would be able to produce on its own given current technology. Sniper Elite 4 gives us a bit of a best case for the Vega M GPU as Vega plays well with the asynchronous compute shaders used in Sniper's DX12 implementation. Note that all these DGPUs, unless otherwise stated, were tested with our old standard 7700K at 4.5 GHz for GPU benchmarking. We're still GPU bottlenecked in those cases. The stock system lands at 72 FPS average with lows at 60 FPS. This positions it just above the GTX 1050 Ti with an RX 470 and 7700K outperforming the Nook by about 22%. Overclocking the Nook pushes us to 81 FPS average, closing that gap and providing performance somewhere between a 1050 Ti and an RX 470 or 570 when unrestrained by the CPU. For Honor gives us a traditional DirectX 11 title with more software abstraction layers than Sniper Elite 4. For this one, the NUC operates at 59 FPS average when stock, with lows at 50 FPS. That puts the Hades Canyon unit about where a GTX 1050 Ti performs, with an RX 470 about 27% ahead when coupled with the 7700K. Overclocking the NUC pushes it to 65 FPS average, lows scaling reasonably, for a gain of 11% over stock. Ghost Recon is another traditional DX11 title with very high settings at 1080p. The Hades Canyon Nook ends up at 44 FPS average, again just ahead of the 1050 Ti and below the RX 470. The Vega M GPU and i7 do well in this game when compared to much larger discrete components. We use Ashes of the Singularity as a synthetic benchmark at this point, but it does give another DX12 implementation to consider. For this one, we're at 30 FPS average for the stock Nook, or 18 FPS for 0.1% lows. That puts us considerably ahead of the GTX 1050 Ti, about 35%, and overclocking the Nook positions the stock RX 470 about 13% ahead. Again, not bad for such a small box, though it is screaming loud and burning up with that overclock. So speaking of overclocking, to go over the process, the BIOS is entered by slamming F2 throughout the boot process because it boots too quickly otherwise. That gets into Intel's visual BIOS, which they haven't showed since their motherboards were killed, basically. And then you can use that technically to do overclocking, but we've found that the XTU utility through software is actually better. Typically, we don't like software for overclocking at all, but in this case, it gives you the ability to easily remove many of the power limits. So in the process of overclocking, what you'll run into first is a power limit for the CPU. It's basically immediate. And once you've maxed that out to an unlimited power limit, the next thing you run into is a thermal limit, obviously. And for that, you can go into BIOS, increase the fan speed to 100% and alleviate some of that, but not a whole lot. So looking at the unit then, all the cooling is handled here. This is the aluminum fin stack. It's pretty small. However, they've got it butted up right against two pretty large blower fans. Taking the heatsink off though, we see that there's more than just the small aluminum fin stack. The entire underside, the cold plate, is one giant vapor chamber, which contributes a lot to the cooling ability of what's otherwise a pretty small and compact cooling solution. And these blower fans are able to spin a bit slower than previous generations just because they're bigger, and so they can push more air with a lower fan RPM and therefore slightly lower noise levels, which we'll talk about in a bit. So these are pushed right up against that aluminum fin stack. The aluminum fin stack uh, only gives you so much area to dissipate the heat even though the fans are capable of a lot of airflow. So that's our biggest bottleneck in terms of cooling. Then there's a single copper plate right there to sink the heat from the components. In terms of the overclocking, what we ended up with was 4.3 gigahertz all core for Blender it throttled down to 4.2 over the period of more than an hour of benchmarking. And we ended up with memory overclocked to 3200 megahertz with uh, Wattman pushing our GPU for 1320 and 900 megahertz and the power target maxed out. A box this small will inevitably become constrained thermally when under adverse conditions. With the help of some thermocouples and software, we collected a lot of thermal data for the stock box and stock fan curve. A 100% fan curve was also tested with stock settings and an overclock configuration with 100% speeds. Note that all testing was done in a controlled environment with constant ambient temperature Ambient was logged second to second with discrepancies normalized. Running Firestrike Extreme for 30 minutes, the stock Hades Canyon box reached steady state at about 76 degrees Celsius average core temperature. This is completely acceptable. The GPU also operated acceptably at 70 degrees Celsius with the SSD at 64 degrees, PCH at 61 degrees, and motherboard at 59 degrees. 
With the exact same settings but an irritating 100% fan speed, we measured roughly a 20 degree drop across the board. Intel tunes the Nook to be usable in a living room and doesn't blast the fan speed unnecessarily when thermals are well within control, as they were in our stock tests. Regardless, that gives us an idea for headroom. Overclock to 4.3 GHz, 1320 MHz GPU, and 900 MHz for the memory, we landed nearing throttle territory at 91 degrees Celsius on the CPU, with the GPU still lower than stock. But that's because of the boosted fan speed, benefiting the GPU in this case more than the CPU, which was pushing its power limit pretty high. Noise was tested at our standard 20 inch distance with a fixed place DBA meter. The noise floor of the room is a low 26 DBA. When idle on desktop and with stock settings, we measured an output of noise of 30 DBA at 20 inches distance, not bad. And that extends to lightweight browsing and things like that. Gaming under stock settings and fan curves results in a 36 dBA noise level from 5 minutes to 30 minutes of play and onward, which is certainly audible but not louder than the average game console under similar load. Maxed out, we're measuring 53.1 dBA for the fan, but it's high-pitched whining noise and it resembles a leaf blower at a distance. The type of noise is irritating. Fortunately, you'll never really encounter it unless you're manually configuring for a big overclock like we did, so we can't complain too much. This isn't something you'll encounter under auto fan curve settings. As for Blender on the CPU components, not rendering on Vega M, we measured Intel's contribution as performing roughly equivalently to an i5-8400, which completed the GN Monkey head render in about 43 minutes. The Nook finished in 44 minutes, overclocking to 4.3 GHz, though thermal throttling down to 4.2, resulted in a 41.6 minute completion time for the Nook. That puts us between the stock Intel i5-8600K and the i5-8400. For the GN logo render, we completed the process in 56 minutes stock, or 52 minutes overclocked on the Hades Canyon box. Comparatively, this is roughly equivalent to either an i5-8400 or R5-1500X at 4 GHz. Not particularly powerful on the CPU front, but that limitation is partly due to thermals. We could overclock higher if we had thermal headroom, it just doesn't exist in this box. As a unit, the Intel Hades Canyon box actually really impressed us. The performance coming out of Vega and the AMD contribution is substantial and is a, basically the primary contributor to the ability of this Hades Canyon box to compete with modern discrete components. It does so exceptionally well. It's very expensive. You absolutely pay for the form factor. So if you're trying to replace a cheap or mid-range gaming computer with one of these, it's not gonna happen at a price level. If you're trying to get one of these for something like, for example, going on the road and using it for editing, which is something we're strongly considering, then it's excellent for that. Or if you're trying to use it for attaching to the back of your TV with the vase amount and using it for an HTPC, it's really good in those use cases. You could build something similar for cheaper, yes, but you couldn't build something exactly this form factor with this level of compute power, graphics power especially, in such a small enclosure with reasonable audio levels, at least without the overclocks. Overclocking is fun. I'm glad they've enabled it. It's nice that it's unlocked. It's not something you should push as far as we did, unless you're really okay with never being able to hear again. But beyond that, you could do some basic overclocks for with, without increasing the noise levels too much. You end up at about 40 dBA before it starts to get annoying in terms of uh, subjective type of noise. As a unit, we can absolutely recommend it. The price, again, it's not unfair. It's high, yes, but it's not unfair for what you get. Uh, the performance was exceptional and surprised us. We really hope to see more of this in the future. The, the fact that AMD and Intel here work together on a product that actually turned out really well says a lot about the industry. First of all, this is probably partly where you're seeing GPP and similar NVIDIA initiatives come from. NVIDIA definitely is going to feel pressure from this. This doesn't compete with their DGPU market. You don't buy one of these and put it in a PCIe slot. That said, it does show the future for where they'll see competition in smaller devices like laptops or other portable devices. Zotac makes those Z boxes, things like that. Suddenly, if these Vega M GPUs and Intel combinations become more popular, NVIDIA's got a lot to worry about. And they're going to probably try to control that market a little bit, which is some of what we're seeing. So they're feeling the pressure and it's for good reason. This is really good competition from two people who basically never work together other than cross-licensing x86 and x64. That's the start and the end of their relationship. So we like it, like what we see. 
uh, yes, expensive, maybe don't buy it if you're trying to just get a gaming PC for cheap, because it's not that. But if you have a use case in mind, we can recommend it on a hardware level. It performs well, the thermals are completely reasonable under stock settings, the fan noise was completely reasonable under stock settings, overclocking is great to have the option, uh, even though it does get a bit loud, and we might try and fix that ourselves in a near mod uh, in the future. So subscribe for more as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like this one on the table, which currently is housing all the parts. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly and join our Patreon Discord, where I hang out for part of the day and talk with people. And I'll see you all next time.